Friends, greetings from Motovan Studio A. Today we are missing something pretty large here in the studio. No, I don't mean the roof of the pagoda that usually hides over there with the two Porsches and the Jag. No, we are missing something incredibly large, and that is one of the airplanes. The Nanchang CJ6 is out getting some work done because it's going on a half cross-country trip. It is going to be heading to Oshkosh, which is like the major AvGeek fly-in thing. That comes up next month, and the plan is to head uh, leave here on July 21st. So the plane, that's the one that's going to be leaving. It's a two-seat plane. It's got more room. Uh, so that one has to have some work done to it. And then the only thing we are left with today is the Yak-50, which you can see over here. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? I'm trying another new mic on this Ask Moto Man segment here from Moto Man Studio A. Can you guys hear me okay with this new mic? Because I want to make sure that we have the gear that works well for this little segment because I had fun doing it with you guys. Oh, good. Okay, so I want to give you an overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, number one, we're going to talk about the 2018 Sonata Turbo. This is the 20T. We did do, already do an episode on this car way back. You know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn this around for you guys so you can actually see what's going on here. Here it is. The 2018 Hyundai Sonata Turbo. So this is like a fully kitted out limited model. I wanted to spend some time talking to you about this one because now I've had a little bit more time to play around with it. Hopefully the wind didn't hit my mic there. I've had some more time to play around with this thing, and I wanted to share some feedback with you now that I've actually used it more than a day that we had in San Diego that was, what, almost a year ago. That was in July. Uh, sadly, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I'm going to show it to you because it's stunningly beautiful, and it usually is not in this spot here. I'm sure you would agree that that is just wow. That is the epitome of class, if I have to say so myself. That car, it's a stunning design. It's super simple, but it's elegant. And everything just works so incredibly well. Like this one, I'm sure you guys have seen Pagodas in the past, but this one is in unusually good shape. Just look at some of the details of the chrome work. That's how you can tell when a car has been restored well. So a lot of times when the chrome work is not done well, there's a lot of pitting on it. This one is really special. Anyway. Uh, let's go back over to the Hyundai and talk a little bit about the Hyundai. I wanted to give you some feedback here because I've actually had some time now to use it. And what I'm finding is, why do people continue, and this is kind of a question to all of you guys, why do people continue to buy crossovers when there are rather good sedans out here like this? Uh, this one is efficient. It is, there's a motorcycle. This one's efficient. It actually works incredibly well around town. It's got plenty of power. Uh, this one is rather elegant on the inside because it's very fancy. Let me show you here. I've got the Apple CarPlay set up going. You can see there. This one's got the gray interior with the blue accent on the stitching and the turbo in here as well. It's got Apple CarPlay. There's a whole bunch of things I like about this. But what I found now that I've used it, I want to actually open up the hood for you guys. I'm going to turn this around here. Uh, what I found is this is like an office on wheels. And it's, it's, I was just talking with my uh, lunch meeting today, and we were jacking around about the whole um, concept of an office on wheels. And yeah, you know, people talk about cars, coming autonomous cars, and how it's going to change the world, and all that kind of stuff where you and I, we want to continue to drive our cars. And here's an instance where I've probably put most of the miles on this car by driving on the freeway. And it's been incredibly productive driving this thing on the freeway because of the combination of Apple CarPlay, the satellite radio, and then, interesting enough, it's got all this... I mean, it's a luxury car at the end of the day. It's a Hyundai sedan. It's like a mid-size D-segment sedan, so it competes with the Camrys of the world, the Fusions of the world, cars like that. But it has heated, cooled seats. Um, it has, this one's obviously got a premium sound system. This one's got uh, lumbar support. So what you find is 
it's effortless to drive. It's kind of like you really can't see here, but it's kind of like wearing a comfortable pair of pants. And that's the thing that stands out with this car. Now, there is something I'm going to say here. I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see it. It's got a good amount of power. I mean, is it the GTR? No, that I just gave up. I'm waiting till you see the episodes. We've got two episodes of that coming up. The tech review and the full first drive review. So this one, it's, you know, what is it? It's sub 300 horsepower. This one's uh, 245 horsepower. It's a four cylinder turbo. And it's surprising how well it works around town. So here I was driving from Long Beach to uh, Torrance back to the airport today. And I have to say that's a Subaru. Yes, that's a DRX. Uh, I have to say that I've been spending some time now with this thing driving on the freeway. And it's interesting to me how this thing actually works incredibly well on the freeway. Now, I will tell you that I've had a, I think the best way to describe it is when you go from a very powerful car, like a 577 horsepower Mercedes AMG to that, this, it, it's not like this car f seems slow. And what happens when I usually make adjustments like that, when I go from a super powerful car to something like this, usually you feel like, oh my God, this car can't go anywhere. Jesus Christ. I need something powerful again. Like what happened when I went from the E63 S wagon to something else. This, I don't feel that. Now granted, you're not comparing apples to apples. It's two different cars. But this is usable power, where the 577 horsepower that's in that Mercedes was just it smacks you in the face and just it makes you forget anything else that came before it. Where other cars in this segment, sometimes you actually have to push to get power out of them. Where this one, you really don't have to push to get so much power out of them. Like um, even the Avalon, granted bigger car than that, but the Avalon with the V6, you have to dig a bit more on that one because the torque comes in at a higher point. If you remember, the torque comes in at, what, 4,400 RPM in that one. This one, the torque comes in at just below 2,000 RPM. So the combination of it's, yeah, down on power, and it's a little bit smaller car, but having the torque come in lower makes the power of this thing significantly more usable. So I'm rambling a lot right now about this, but the point I'm saying is you can go from a ridiculously powerful car to this and not feel like, oh, my God, my life is over. Um, so I will say I'm going to open it to questions on the Hyundai right now. We'll get to more questions to questions on Hyundai. While I wait for your questions, I am going to show you three things about the Hyundai. So follow me. Let's go back to the Hyundai. Uh, point number one, I want to show you one neat little trick here. I'm going to turn this around. See the little Hyundai badge here? Okay, first question came in here. Great about the luxury CPO BMW. That fell apart. I didn't see that. So why don't you put that question up again about the CPO BMW. Anyway, you see this little Hyundai badge here. One of the things that I find interesting about this is there is no, like, kick to open. Like, you can't kick to open the, uh, the trunk on this one. But there is, like, a hidden button. This is the button that opens the trunk. So you can see how the storage works in here. Give you an idea there. That's my flight bag. You can see that. Anyway, so that's one thing I wanted to show you. I think that's incredibly neat, the way they have hidden this button in the actual Hyundai display. And then let's go to the inside of the car. I want to show you something else here. Come and join me next to the Yak. This, I got to be honest with you, I do not remember if this was the case last year, but the steering wheel, it's actually, the design of the steering wheel is actually quite interesting. It looks, it does, you know, Hyundai's plastic, not their strong suit, but what they've done here is it looks like someone spent some time sculpting the steering wheel, which you're going to spend most of your time looking at the steering wheel of a car as you're going down the road, well, you look at the road, but at the end of the day, the thing that's in your face the most is the steering wheel, and this Overall, these small changes, the way they've shaped the details around the steering wheel, so all the buttons there, and then they've shaved off. This isn't like a big block here for the airbag. The way they did this, it makes it, 
it's a it's a higher quality design detail. Remember when we've talked about design in the past. I know we've talked a lot about design, and I know I've been accused of being a design geek. But design, it doesn't cost extra. And here's a great example of it. It costs the same to make those buttons, to make the airbag enclosure, to make this, this like satin chrome finish. It costs the same for all of this stuff here, whether it looks good or doesn't look good. So why the hell not make it look good like that? And then the third thing I want to show you, let me come back here, turn the camera around. Okay, here we go. And this is more of a question. What do you think of the front end design of this? So if you remember, this was a mid-cycle refresh that they did of this thing, and we saw it first in July of 2017. And what they did is they changed this design. I would argue that looks like it was completely ripped off from a Ford Fusion. Look at the front of that grill, look at the opening of the grill, look at the shape of the lights. Granted, they're a bit bigger. And then they even have this LED intelligent light system, like we even need that there. And then they put this cool like fog light corner light kind of thing in here. Those are really the only differentiation points from the Ford. But to me, I, I like that it cleans up the front of the car, but at the end of the day, does it look too much Ford Fusion? So I'm gonna leave that question out for you guys. Okay. Uh, Qu the floor is open for questions on the Hyundai. Oh, you know what? The floor is also open for questions on the Mercedes here while we're at it. And then what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, questions that you have on the Hyundai. We're going to talk about questions you have on other recent cars we have on the show. And then I'm going to give you an update and answer some questions that I took off of recent episodes while we're talking here. So join me in my living room here at Motoman Studio A and let's chat amongst ourselves. So uh, let's start with a question that I got on the Mazda 6. So some of you may know that I recently went home last week. It was not really for the best reasons. Oh, man, a lot of questions have come in here. Do you agree with... Oh, <laughs> the flat-bottom steering wheel? I, you know what? For a Hyundai, this is a very good question. Do I agree with the flat-bottom steering wheel on these cars? And... I don't think it just applies to, it applies to Toyotas like uh, they do on uh, that, that sportier version of the, of, the, of the Camry. Mazda does it. So many companies do it. Audi does it a lot. I think they were the first ones to really roll it out in all their cars. I mean, if it's not a Lotus Six Siege, I don't think we really need the flat bottom steering wheel. It's a neat little design touch, but sometimes I think it's a bit too much. That's just one man's opinion. Uh, anyway, uh, I want to go back to the question about the Mazda 6 that I got. Some of you know that I went to New York uh, just this past week, and I was there for, to, to celebrate a life, to celebrate 100 years of an amazing life. And while I was there, Mazda was incredibly kind to give me a Mazda 6. Now, some of you have asked a lot of questions. When are, you, when are we going to see an episode on the Mazda 6, the new one? When are we going to see a, an episode on the Mazda 6? And you are. And the original plan was you were going to see the episode in probably late July, early August, because we're getting the car in late July. And that we're getting here in California. We're going to get one of the fancier ones. And I'm going to do like a tech review and a full first drive review. So you'll see that. Mazda did a very different launch of this whole thing. They didn't do like a whole big program. They had like a, a very small local program in D.C. And then they didn't do the usual like we do with Coleman. And we, we film the two episodes and then we fill in the Coleman tech review. Uh, I am going to try to get Coleman to come out for that. So hopefully, you know, cross your fingers, it's not 100%. Um, but the folks at Mazda, they were kind enough to loan me a car in advance of this shoot that I drove in my hometown, and it was wonderful to be there. Uh, in any event, what happened was I got some time, advanced time in the car, and some initial, the road noise like. It was funny, I put up, if you look on my Instagram, I put up a video of driving through the Holland Tunnel, and there was no traffic. And I was showing you guys the video of uh, the navigation system shows you actually in a tunnel while you're in a tunnel. I thought that was an interesting instance of art imitates life. Anyway, there was a question of what's the road noise like? And i got to be honest with you, it is not any more noticeable than this Hyundai, or it's not more noticeable than, say, the, um, 
uh, Camry that we drove or the bigger car, the Avalon. So overall, it was definitely kind of on par with its with its stablemates. Now, the thing person was, I think you were loud on the inside, and there's a reason why those cars were loud on the inside. Uh, Mazda, as you know, they are fanatics about cutting weight, and what they do is they take weight out in any area that they can. One of the areas that they do it is to take it out in sound deadening. So in the case of the Mazda 6, that's one of the cars where they took some of the weight out. Well, you can clearly tell the minute you get in that car, A, it's a much more luxurious place to be, and B, it is definitely quieter than the car it replaces, but it's not any more quiet than its competition. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I know a couple questions came up while I was chatting there, so why don't you put those questions back up and I'll get back to your, your question there. Uh, next question is regarding the BMW X4 that we had the tech review on. There's been a lot of confusion over uh, the first drive review. Why, isn't, why haven't we seen the first drive review yet? You are going to see the first drive review. It's coming this Saturday. It's going to come late. Basically, there was a global embargo. BMW was very good to give us very early access to that car. So as a result, like literally, as you and I are talking media from all over the world that's driving the car, so as a fairness to everybody, what BMW does is ask folks like us to hold our driving impressions until a certain date. Didn't mean I had to hold the tech review. So you'll notice that like the video, that tech review is one of the first few like really comprehensive episodes of, a, of one of those cars on the global embargo lifts, I believe, at midnight CET. Let me get this question here before it goes away. I'm sorry, that thing went away. I'm going to open it up on the computer so hopefully I can see them while I'm still talking to you. Anyway, um, the global embargo lifts at midnight uh, CET, so that's Munich time. So what I'm going to do is, or it's already been done, uh, the episode is scheduled to launch Pacific time on the Saturday. So it's technically July 1st is when the embargo lifts, but Saturday, uh, June 30th at like, what is that going to be? Uh, 3, at 3 p.m., I believe, is when it's going to go live here. So that means 6 p.m. in East Coast if you are on uh, East Coast time. So hopefully that clears up some confusion. What I'm going to do now is open up uh, my browser here, and hopefully I can see the questions as I'm talking to you a little bit easier than what's on this small screen here. While I'm doing that, uh, what do you guys, why don't you throw up some questions and we can go from there. Uh, oh, I do have another question I want to share with you on the Mazda 6. I got a question on the Mazda 6 on how does it drive. I'm not going to share all the details with you about the driving dynamics of that car right now because obviously I want to save that for the full first drive review. But I am going to share a detail for you and that is the steering. Uh, you guys full well know that Mazdas, they, they're one of my favorite cars to drive, whether it's a Mazda 3, Mazda CX-3, um, the, obviously the Miata. I've got to be honest with you, I, I, there are other choices I would consider. The CX-5 is really good, but that segment is so competitive now, it's not like a clear-cut choice like the, like the 3 is or like the Miata is. Uh, so there are other choices I would consider in addition to the CX-5, although the CX-5 is competitive. Anyway, bringing this point up, because when you look at a Mazda, one of the things that you notice is the steering is you don't have that vague on-center feel like you do with, uh, maybe not the Sonata. The actual steering is actually pretty good, especially when you go into sport mode in the Sonata. But the steering on, say, a Camry, there is a vague on-center feel. In the Mazda... There's two settings. There's a sports setting and a regular setting. When you're in the regular setting, it's incredibly vague. I was shocked how it, it's un like how the steering is set up. But then you put it in the sport mode, and in the sport mode, it's, it's beyond what Mazdas used to be. In other words, there's a, there's a heft to the steering that you would get in a German car, not a previous Mazda. So it looks to me that Coleman... He's played around with the tech that they've now allowed to have in these cars. And I think they're doing this to get more people to buy the car. I think by offering that Vagon center field, which you and I, we're not that excited about Vagon center field. But I think the reason why they're doing it here is let's have a, uh, a vehicle that can be competitive against the Camry for people who are not car guys. I think that's the logic. Don't hold me to it. It's something I will ask. 
Coleman when I get him back on the show because I was really taken back how different the steering was in this because it's the first thing you notice. And I got to tell you, the minute I got in the car, I picked it up from Newark Airport and immediately got on uh, the one nine to get back into the city. And it was like night and day. I'm like, is this a Mazda? And then finally I started playing around with the car and switched it over to the Sport and was back to what you and I would find interesting with a Mazda. So that's the one thing that really stood out to me and I wanted to give to you guys right away before we get into the full-on tech review and the full first drive review and all that kind of stuff. So I'll share with you also the turbo engine because that one I had had the turbo engine. Anyway, so why don't you bring up some questions here and I will read your questions and try to get to some of uh, the stuff here. Uh, another question that came in on the BMW, and it was the build quality on the inside of the car. Some of you folks asked, well, what was it like on the inside of the X4? Because my previous car, or the X2, we talked about some of the build quality, especially like the lower door panels on that one, wasn't quite up to snuff, where the top of the door, top of the dash, and the door panels themselves actually were really good. And what I found was, Clearly, someone spent some time investing money into the uh, color and trim as well as the materials of the X4. So what's happened now is the X4, the interior is a much better version of the car that replaces. It doesn't look significantly different because it still has the dash thing. I mean, yeah, it is different, but it still has the, the, uh, that same like um, iPad-esque type thing that came from the G12 7 series which then went to the G35 series, and now has made it way, its way into this X4. And clearly they're going for a more upmarket feel inside this car because they obviously spent more money on the interior, and this car is, the base price is 50 grand, and the one that you're seeing on Saturday was something like almost $80,000 in the sticker price. So instead of being like the X2, where the base price on that, at least in Europe, is like in the 30s because it's it, it, you can get a low content version there where here you can only get a $38,000 one and then a, the, the one we drove the X2 was a $50,000 one which I think was too much money for that car um, so the the actual build quality the inside of the interior matched the 30s price tag not the 50s price tag get where I'm going with this anyway I'm having a hard time seeing your your uh, questions here because they're by the time I finish a, an answer they're already gone. I'm going to figure out a way to get this on here. Let me see if this pulls it up. Nope, that doesn't pull it up. i got to figure out a way to run this because it's not coming up on my screen here. Anyway, next question on that, and I won't dive off into the whole question while I'm waiting for a question from you guys. Uh, what else on pro? Oh, i got to share with some programming stuff uh, while we're talking here. Okay, here comes a question. Okay, so real quickly, what I saw there was for Urban, why bother op owning an electric car? Is that the question? Why don't you restate that question? Because, again, it fell off a little quick. I don't know what's going on with the platform today. The, the questions are not staying up as long as they usually, they usually do, so I'm having a hard time getting to them. Is BMW trying to target? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Is BMW trying to target too many segments. So what I'm taking your question as to be, is BMW slicing the pie too thin by having an X1, an X2, an X3, an X4, an X5, an X6? And then if you look, Mercedes is doing the same thing. And now you're going to start seeing Lexus do the same thing. And then, I don't know if you guys saw, but stupidity of stupidity. Did you guys see the Chevrolet Blazer? I for the life of me, cannot understand what in God's name Chevrolet was thinking, and allow me to go off onto a tangent, because this will answer your question. Um, Chevrolet has a Trax, an Equinox, a Traverse, a Tahoe, and a Suburban. So that is three SUV, CUV kind of family cars. Three of those are crossovers, meaning front-wheel drive-based unibody vehicles, and then they've got two body-on-frame SUVs. Seems like it's been working for them for a very long time. Then the brain surgeons at Chevrolet, and you know me, I grew up on GMs, so I love GM, and I grew up on Chevys, Chevys and Buicks. Love me Chevys and Buicks. 
But the, this is what I'm thinking. The brain surgeons at Chevrolet saw that Ford was coming out with a Bronco. They know very little bit about it. So they said, you know what? We need another crossover so we can compete not on the product. We can compete not on really the number of rows. They already have not one but two two-row crossovers. This is another two-row crossover. So it's a third two-row crossover, and it is a front-wheel drive-based vehicle. Now, if I'm a product planner at General Motors, I already have a Chevrolet Traverse, which is three rows, and I have a GMC Acadia, which for all intents and purposes is two rows, and that's what the Blazer is based on. But look what the hell is happening here. They come out with another crossover, so now they've added, so what, you've got six now, and really there is no discernible difference other than the design between an Equinox and a Blazer. Yeah, the Blazer's a little bit bigger, but if you dig down into the numbers, which I did, the storage capacity of the Blazer is almost identical to the Equinox. And I'm thinking to myself, whether it's a sport or cross, it's a utility vehicle. Sport or crossover utility vehicle. So if you're giving me a new one, why isn't there more utility? My logic was thinking, well, if you're going to come out with a Blazer and use that name, you damn well better make a real-wheel drive-based vehicle. Because look what the hell Ford is doing with the... Um, the Aviator. They could have easily made that a front-wheel drive vehicle, but instead they have a rear-wheel drive platform, and if I'm reading the T's correctly, that means it's going to be a rear-wheel drive uh, full car. So why on God's green earth would General Motors come out with a smaller car BMW? I feel like it's not just BMW. I feel like there's a lot of different car companies that are slicing the pie entirely too thin in this crossover game when there's not enough differentiation. If I was a product planner or I was a, a car czar like Bob Lutz was, and you know if Bob Lutz was there, this never would have happened. If I was a car czar at, at, at General Motors, I would differentiate that Blazer and really make it a Blazer. You already have the Colorado platform. Throw a, a, a cool-looking, chunky, trucky, like super SUV body on top of that thing. It's like mid-size that kind of is a little bit smaller than a forerunner, maybe not as long. And then what, who else do you have to compete with? You've got the forerunner and you'll have the Bronco. That's it. Where this ridiculous blazer, it competes with like six vehicles that I can think of off the top of my head, probably more. Anyway, that is a very long-winded answer to the question of uh, do I think BMW is slicing the pie too thin? Yes, I think BMW is, is slicing the pie too thin, but I also think so many other car companies are slicing the pie too thin. And I think what's happened now is it's the platform sharing. We've talked about MQB and we talked about SPA, and really what that is, the cost of developing the platform is already taken care of when they do the MQB bits. So they're not building uh, one platform for, say, like BMW does one platform for the BMW 3 Series and 4 Series, which the X4 is based on. Where uh, General Motors, what they've done is they've taken this one platform, underpins the GMC Acadia, but guess what? It also underpins the Buick LaCrosse, which also underpins all of these other cars, so they can kind of afford to do it. The question is, how much longer can they continue to do this? Because how many people are really going to buy a Blazer as opposed to an Equinox? This thing is not going to be cheap. An, uh, an Equinox is already in the 20s to 30s. The Traverse is already in the late 30s up to the high 40s. Where does that leave room for the Blazer? i got to be honest with you. You hear me going off on this tangent about the Blazer. I am mad about the Blazer because it, I love the Blazer. Who didn't love not just the K5 Blazer, but also the S10 Blazer? I have fond memories of going skiing in the Northeast in an S10 Blazer. What the hell is the Blazer? Now, Grant, I'll admit, it's better looking than an Equinox and a Traverse, but it doesn't really add anything to the party. And some of the design has been stolen from the Nissan Murano. Look, look at the, the C pillar on that thing. It looks like it came straight from a Nissan Murano. Anyway, I have, there were other questions that came up. I'm going to get off on my tangent, but the short answer to your question is, yes, I think they're swiping, slicing the pie way too thin there. Next question.
And while we're waiting, we have a Cessna coming in for a landing here. Isn't it wonderful to sit here in the living room of Motorman Studio A and watch planes land? You guys really can't see it. I'll turn the, I'll turn the camera around so you can see real quick, but it has to adjust. That plane already went past. So <coughs> Mazda, oh, do you mean the Miata with a more powerful engine? Is that what you're asking about? So what you're looking at there is the approach to uh, two nine right and two nine left at uh, Torrance Airport, also known as Torrance Country Club. Is your question about the new, more powerful, the 180 horsepower Miata? Oh, two two diesel. The potential. You know what? Ah, you hit me at a bad time because I know something that I can't tell you. I. We need to go to the next question. I, I know something and I can't tell you, and I'll get shot if I tell you anything. And I know if I go off on a tangent, it'll slip out, and I, I can't. Yeah, so let's go on to the next question. Uh, can we talk about the Miata with more horsepower? How about that? Let's talk about the Miata with more horsepower. Oh, greetings to Europe. Where are you, where are you uh, joining us from Europe? I haven't been to Europe this summer, man. I got to get over there. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm jealous you guys got the diesel Mazda over there. I'm jealous about a lot of diesels you have over there. I got to be honest, man. If I lived in, like, Colorado at some point, do you think... Do I think people own electric cars... You know, that's, that's a really good question. Do I really think people own electric cars? And I like to answer, I consider this a financial question. I do not consider this a car question. I like to answer financial questions as if, what would I do? Or what do I see really happening? And I'm going to answer the question from the California Republic. As you can imagine, you know, they're all a bunch of hippies out here. They're all communists. They want to save the planet. They think I club seals for a living. So... You can imagine what I'm dealing with out here. Um, and what I've noticed is a lot of people own electric cars. You know I am totally against leasing. I, I know subscriptions are coming on strong. I don't doubt that they will go very big. I have no doubt about it. Do I think it's the right way to acquire a vehicle? No, I think it's a lease by any other name is still a lease. And many years down the road, it will have a huge negative impact on your overall financial picture. I'll get it. I keep on promising you a leasing episode. I have yet to release it, but it's, it's going to be an interesting episode and explain why I don't like leasing or really subscribing to cars for that matter. But what I thought would happen is many people would lease electric cars. That's honestly what I thought. And in reality, I can't tell you how many people I know that own electric cars like not lease and it happened one of two ways there were folks who leased electric car their first go around were so happy about it they ended up buying their car meaning either out of the lease or they went and bought a new one or i've had a number of friends of mine that they're like hey man i want to buy a car because i want to commute and i want to get into the diamond lane can i get one of these what do you think about these electric cars and you'd be surprised how many friends of mine have bought electric cars and are incredibly happy with them like to the point where now that I've seen their use case if I let's say I stopped doing this tomorrow I would seriously consider getting an electric car as a commuter like would I go and spend the money on a Tesla no I don't I don't think that's a prudent choice but would I spend the money on the upcoming leaf that will have the 200 mile range I was about to curse Absolutely. Uh, would I buy a used Bolt with the right charger system in it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do I like the concept of a Tesla Model 3? I do, but not at $45,000. That's ridiculous. To me, a Model 3, I don't know if you've actually, if you guys have went and looked at a Model 3 and touched it and seen it, the build quality is ridiculous. Like, I've seen Model Ts with better build quality. I like the concept of a $30,000 electric car with 200 miles, and I think that's kind of where it needs to be for people to get over the range anxiety and to actually buy them, not just lease them. 
So hopefully that answers your question. A couple of questions came up while going off on that tangent. Or really answering that question. There's a lot of traffic coming in. Another Cessna Sky Lane is coming in. Missed that one again. I don't know if you guys are aware that the Cessna still make uh, their Skyline, which is their 172. I just found out they're 500 grand new, which is crazy. Oh, yes. Let's get to the Mazda Miata with over 180 horsepower. Who doesn't like that? Okay, so there's two things. I have two schools of thought. Number one, I honestly, you're, gonna, you're not going to like this. I really didn't think the Miata needed a whole hell of a lot of power. Like, if you're just using it as a fun car to drive around town as a commuter, which you totally could, and I would commute in it, or if you're looking just to have just a car that is somewhat sporty, the power it's got is more than adequate. It's quick. The British used to call cars like that sprightly. You know how I feel about British cars. It is a great car to use around town. Now, if you're adding more power, this is the problem of adding more power to a Miata. That car, it's like, it's a perfect ecosystem. If you add more power, you have to go and change everything else. It's like the extreme case of that AMG GTR. They added 74 more horsepower to that car over the base car, but they went through to allow for the 70, or really make the 74 more horsepower usable, they had to add in a ton of suspension changes, which let me tell you, Santa Maria Madre de Dios, Wow, do they work. I cried like a schoolgirl when they took that car from me, especially knowing I was getting a Hyundai. Anyway, the Miata, it's even more important because the lighter car needs to be more balanced. It's like the Elise. If you change one thing about the Elise, you have to change everything. And the minute you start changing everything, you lose the entire purpose of the car, the fact that it's a balanced car. You can get away with it in AMG GTR because... 570 horsepower, it solves a lot of problems. Same with a, like a 911 GT3. 500 horsepower solves a lot of problems. So you can change one thing and it, it's hidden in the extra power. Where the balance of the Miata, the balance of the Elise, if you like, I've had friends of mine put big wheels on Elise's, ruins the car, man. You need the perfectly set up wheels from the factory on Elise, and it's the same thing on the Miata. So I am going to reserve judgment on whether this power, extra power works or not until I drive it to see what changes Coleman made in the car besides the engine. I know they listed it down, but does it work or does it not work? Does it have better driving? I mean, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to drive it and find out, see what the driving dynamics are. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. With a Miata or any light car, you change anything, you've got to change everything. What is the next car review you're doing? Uh, okay, this is a good opportunity to kind of recap the thing about the BMW and the couple of next couple of episodes that are coming up. So, turns out we have a lot of stuff on the shelf right now that's been sitting on the shelf for a while because we, you know, we took two months off to kind of regroup, and I think you've now noticed why we took two months off. There was setting up this whole studio, and then if you've noticed this season that the flow of the episodes has been different. Like, we've changed everything. We've changed the length of the episodes. We've changed the, even down to the music you hear underneath the episodes, some of the pacing of the episodes, the way this show is open now. So there was a lot of behind-the-scenes things that we needed to do and change in that two-month period. But it didn't mean that I was stopping any filming. So there were cars that were being shot during that time. So starting this Saturday, you're going to get the BMW X4 first drive review that's the next one coming up then believe you guys remember back in january i had the lc 500h two episodes a tech review and a full first drive review have yet to put those two out those are the episodes you're going to get after the bmw x4 then you're going to get a oh how could i forget do you guys know what july 8th is July 8th is our ninth anniversary. I can't believe it. Nine years of doing this and being on this journey, which has been an incredible journey. I have a very special, once again, travel episode that I'm going to take you on a journey throughout parts of Europe. Uh, and I hope you join me on that episode because what we're looking to do is give you a little bit more different episodes. 
got to be honest, I am kind of tiring of the reviews. Uh, the genre, it's kind of flooded right now. And I, one of the reasons that the episodes have been changed up, the flow and the pacing, and oh, I do the cold opens now with these stand-ups that I do, the open, the cold open monologues that I do in each of the episodes. That's just to kind of keep my creative juices going. Well, you're going to start seeing more new and different kind of episodes. So you already saw that Kia on Ice episode. You're going to see this travelogue episode, which we did one last year for the 8th anniversary. So we're doing one again this year for the 9th anniversary. And then you're going to see some other stuff coming down the pike. Then after that, we have some other um, review episodes we've got to catch up on. We've got a Porsche Panamera Turbo. That one was shot a while ago. You're going to get a full first drive review on that. Then I've got the latest Panamera on offer coming after this car. It's a two-wheel drive. Panamera. So, yes, it's a V6, but it's two-wheel drive. Very excited to drive that. And then, oh, we've got the Porsche Summer. Remember we talked about in the Boxster and the 911T episodes that we're going to get both the Cayman and the 911T back. The 911T comes in, in July. I'm very excited, and it is indeed a manual. I have confirmed that. I don't know what color it is yet, so I'll have to come back to you on that. And then the, uh, the Cayman, I believe, comes in August. And then we still have yet to book a day on the GT3 Touring, but that is indeed coming. I'm kind of excited about that, too. Oh, and then GLC 63 is coming towards the number. Yeah, lightest Panamera. That is, it's kind of a joke, but it's funny. My colleague at, or I should say colleague, but uh, the, my friend at Porsche, uh, Luke, that's how he opened his email. Hey, man, I the lightest Panamera we make. And I'm like, okay, I'm a, I'm a Lotus guy. I'd be happy to try it. And so I went and looked it up. And yeah, it is indeed the lightest car out there. And I'm intrigued to try it, to try a Panamera without driving the front wheels. Because think about it. We spent, what, uh, three episodes trying fast cars where we could turn the front axle off. And the experiment went very well in those three cases. Let's try it with a case where we don't even have the front axle. Anyway, next question. Hopefully that answers your questions about programming. And of course, there's other stuff coming up. We've got, uh, I think, a new Santa Fe coming up. We've got, um... anyway, I think I've given you way too much. Something about a conversation. What else do I have for you guys? I think I've been going for a while here, so I'm going to probably tie this up soon. Well, let's, uh, let's take two more questions. Let's see what's going on. Two more questions. <laughs> Just having a conversation. Okay. I, you know me. I don't have a problem talking. Oh, it's funny, actually. I do want to say something I find incredibly humorous. I do see all of your comments. Let's see what I got here. McLaren and people. That's a good point, man. That's a really good point. Uh, the question really was a statement. McLaren and others should be chasing lightness, not horsepower. I don't know what you want me to say here, because if you've been watching the show for a while, you know that I live in the church of ad lightness and have spent far too much of my own income on cars built in a shed in the southeast of England. So, yeah, I think they should all be chasing lightness instead of 600, 700 horsepower and adding more power. It goes back to the Miata thing. The Miata is perfectly balanced. To get that kind of balance out of a super powerful car, you have to add complexity, which means you have to add weight. And I'm learning that's happening in the airplane world. Like, the, the, the super fun planes to fly are the very light, small planes that are slip, slippery through the air. But when you get into complex planes, yeah, they're, they're fast, man. You can go places really quick, but they're not as fun to fly because they're not as maneuverable. Anyway, I would suggest, like, the McLarens of the world to be chasing lightness, and I would suggest more, like, I would love to see, like, a Boxster that's, like, super light or a Cayman that's just super light. Uh, anyway, what I was going to say before, I read all your comments on the episodes, and every once in a while there's some jackass that has to put on a comment that I talk too much. And I find that incredibly 
humorous but also asinine in that what do you expect me to do? Just stand there in front of the car and say nothing? Do you want me to do an episode where I'm just putting music underneath like sexy shots of the car? You're not coming to me because you want sexy shots of the car. You're coming to me because you're looking for my opinion or what I have to say about the car. So if I talk too much, guess what? Fuck you. Anyway, uh, what's the next question? I'll take one more question. I know one of had a question here. That was more about the weight. How about a different topic? Oh, lightweight Corvette would be pretty cool, man. I'm kind of excited about that mid-engine Corvette of Corvettes, but then I started driving older Corvettes, and really, really, any, yeah, if any topic, we'll go, just not weight. We just talked about weight before. So, um, I drove an old vet, man, and I just, uh, Bentley... To a new Phantom. Hmm. That's a good question. Let me finish the statement, and that's going to be our last question. Um, I drove an old vet. I've always wanted a, an early C3 Corvette. And I was in my, you know, my Lotus days of like, oh, my God, I only want a Lotus and never again with, the, with bigger cars. And then I drove a 69 Corvette 427 with a T-top and a four-speed. And I was like, think back to the day when this car was new. The way it drove, because remember, it had an independent suspension in 1969 and like 435 horsepower. And granted, it, I mean, it was not a Lotus, but I was blown away by how tech that was for 1969 and how today it can still keep up with anything and be fun to drive. And that's when I fell in love with Corvettes again. And now I'm at a point where I have a huge amount of respect for them after driving the current Z06. Still have yet to drive the, the, the current ZR1. I got to get on that. But sadly, uh, folks at General Motors, it's a very challenging to deal with. So don't hold your breath on it. Anyway, um, this last question I want to take, I think, is an incredibly good question. Do, is there anything about a Bentley competitor to the Phantom? And, you know, it's funny you say this because I am a big, big, big fan of a Bentley Mulzahn. Like, one of these days after I get around to buying all the cars I want to buy, I actually do want a Bentley Mulzahn. It's not my cup of tea at all. It's not my kind of car. I don't like big cars. But, wow, man. Holy crap. I just love the way it drives. Love the look of it. Love the interior. It's just, there's a certain feel to it. You don't, there's no nice way to say this. I don't feel like a douchebag when I'm driving a Bentley Mulzahn. I do feel like a douchebag when I'm driving a Rolls-Royce Phantom. I just do. There's nothing, I've never been a Rolls-Royce guy, although I do love the, the Dawn, it's so cool. That's the one Rolls-Royce, the new one, I absolutely love driving. But at the end of the day, I don't think that Volkswagen Group has said yes to a Bentley that will compete with a Phantom. Because I think what they're doing is they're taking the investment they would in a Phantom beater, let's call it that, and make it, put that investment into Bugatti. I think Bugatti exists on that budget. If they did put the money into a Phantom Beater, I feel like that would take away budget from Bugatti. And as you know, there's been more than rumors about a Bugatti sedan. So why would you have a Bentley Phantom competitor when Bugatti could do that work in the same group? Kind of goes back to our original question about the BMW. Do you think BMW is slicing the pie too thin? And here's an instance where I think Volkswagen is finally getting it right. Granted, they sliced the pie way too thin over at Audi. But the fact that they differentiated amongst these exotic brands that they invested in so many years ago and continued, I think, do well with, this is, I think, is a good strategy. But at the end of the day, I am one man. I am not the one writing the checks over at Bentley. And you do have to understand I am ridiculously biased for that Mulzahn and will probably own one at one day. Uh, one day. Okay, so with that, uh, I did see a lot of your questions come up. These questions do come up again. I believe they do come up again on the, uh, in the comments. And if they don't, come back to this episode and put the comments, put your question in the comments. And what I'll do is I'll come in and I'll answer the questions later tonight when I get back into the office. 
and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get to all your questions. Thank you for joining me today and having a little bit of a chat here, a fireside chat at Motoman Studio A. I'm going to get some other work done and make sure to come back on Saturday, as I said, later in the day for the X4 first drive review. And then followed by, we're going to, I'm not doing a uh, next week, you've got July 4th here in uh, the U.S., so it's going to be a little bit of a, an odd week in that episode comes out on Thursday of next week, not Wednesday of next week. And then we, we continue again Saturday with the, uh, the Lexus. Well, you know what? I think that's the anniversary episode. Don't quote me on this one because I am not in front of my computer. Anyway, so X4 is next followed by Lexus Tech Review, followed by the anniversary, the ninth anniversary episode, where you and I go on a tour of Europe together, different places than we went to last year. Anyway, thank you for joining me, and until I see you next time, bis später.